died so you can live, live forever. Let him free you from sin now and experience a real and lasting peace. So I'd like to offer you a free gift to strengthen you in your new relationship with Jesus. To receive your free gift and discover more about walking with Jesus, call us today and ask for offer number 102. Thank you so much for watching. And now, share this gift of everlasting life with others by passing on this video. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. I'd like to welcome all of you for joining us here at the Granite Bay Church. Good to see you. I'd also like to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. We have a very special Sabbath worship service today. We have a guest speaker, and you'll be hearing more about that a little later on. But before we get to all of that, I'd just like to uh, share a few announcements. Our, our media director came to me backstage, and he says, Pastor Ross, I've got a special gift that I want to give anyone who is brave enough to sit in these front rows. So I said, I will pass that along, and this is the gift. We've got a book. It's called Hidden Eyes and Closed Ears. Now, if you're going to sit in the front, we don't want you to hide your eyes and close your ears. We want open ears. But if we have some brave souls who wouldn't mind sitting in these first few chairs here, I know our media crew would thoroughly enjoy it. Thank you so much. We have a, f a brave volunteer. If you're interested in helping us and sitting in the front, we would appreciate it. Thank you. I see some more people coming. We do appreciate that. You know, we get testimonies of people around the world that tune in every week. This is their church family. Uh, they can attend a local church wherever they are, and so even though we don't always see them, they're very appreciative of what we do. Thank you, everyone. Make sure if you're on the front row, you get your little book, and we'll have it in a box at the end of the service, and we'll get that to you. All right, we do have some announcements we want to bring to your attention. You'll find the bulletin. You might have one. It's in the back. If you didn't get one, we'd like to highlight a few of the announcements. First of all, we have a number of fantastic Sabbath school classes that are taking place every Sabbath morning at 10 o'clock. We've got the Sabbath school class here where we study the lesson courtly. But in addition to this class, we've got a Spanish Sabbath school class that Pastor Carlos is leading, and that is in the Amazing Facts facility. We call it the AFCO classroom. We also have a, a Sabbath school class currently focusing on creation. That's happening in the Fellowship Hall. We have another uh, class focused on the sanctuary in heaven and the high priestly ministry of Jesus. That's also in the Fellowship Hall. So there's two classes in the Fellowship Hall separated. And then just this week, we started a new class that I'm excited about. It's because I'm teaching it. It's on Revelation. And that's happening in the chapel. And we have our brand new Heart of the Press, verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Revelation. So if you want to join, it's not too late, 10 o'clock next Sabbath morning. If you're new to the Adventist faith, you need to be in this class. If you don't understand or know Revelation and would like to learn it more, you need to be in this class. We're going verse by verse through the entire book. So come join us. That's at um, 10 o'clock next Sabbath morning. One more class, Pastor Sean Brumman, starting today at 1.30, a baptismal preparation class. For those who are not yet baptized, for those who are thinking about getting baptized, for those who are thinking about rebaptism. Uh, it's going to start at 1.30 in the chapel. Everyone is welcome to come join us for that. So baptismal preparation class, 1.30 this afternoon. Okay, then we also have some other announcements. Of course, we'll continue this morning with our special program entitled The Seven Deadly Myths in Christianity. Very important presentation this morning. We will continue this evening at what time? 7 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. Last night was just real inspiring. So 7 o'clock. This evening, we will continue with that. Uh, we also have an outreach called Gospel on the Go. I'd like to invite Pastor John Q and Pastor Carlos, and they're going to quickly tell us about what's happening this afternoon. Uh, 
So as you know, we started uh, about a month ago, right? We started our outreach ministry, Gospel on the Go, and we have had an average of about 40 people come out every Sabbath afternoon. And so we're going out. We've given out almost over 500 steps to Christ. We're praying with people, and we've already gotten at least three Bible studies uh, in, in the early start. So the reason we're here is because we want you to know that we're restarting this afternoon, right? We took a break last week, but we're restarting this afternoon. And Pastor Q is going to tell us about what is our topic that we're going to study this afternoon. All righty. I know many, some of you don't like going door to door. And so we, on the topic we're going to have is, it's called in-house church evangelism. And what that is, is how does, how will Jesus plan work here, even in the church? And so if you have a hard time knocking on doors, Come out, listen to it, and we'd love to have you, and you can learn more about how to reach out to people, whether it's here or in the community or wherever it may be. All right, join us at 3 o'clock today. All righty, hey, God bless. Thank you, thank you, pastors. Uh, is that going to be right here, Carlos, in the church, or is it going to be at Amazing Facts? It's going to be at Amazing Facts. So if you come to the church at 3 and no one's here, just walk over to the Amazing Facts building. And we're going to be talking about not only how we reach people outside the church, but how can we be an encouragement and blessing to people inside the church. So that's at 3 o'clock this afternoon. There is a special women's ministry event that is upcoming. I'd like to invite Suzanne to come. She's going to tell us about something happening April the 18th. Yes. So that is next Sunday, April 18th. We're going to meet here at the Fellowship Hall. 4 o'clock, we're going to gather in uh, teams and we're going to develop some Bible trivia questions and challenge each other. We'll do that for 45 minutes. And then for those that want to continue on, we're going to go for a walk at a nearby trail. So please do bring your Bibles if you want to participate. You can also just participate in the first half of the meeting if you want um, and not go on the walk. And please RSVP to gbwministry at gmail.com. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. All right. I know the ladies really enjoyed the last walk that they did. They even met someone who showed up out of the blue who just happened to arrive at the church. I think they were just driving past and they ended up walking with the ladies and had a wonderful time. So you never know who you're going to meet on these trips. Uh, then I want to just tell you about a date and you can just make a mental note of it. You do not want to miss May the 15th. That's a Sabbath. It's going to be our dedication Sabbath of our new church facilities. Now, there are two things to bear in mind. There's what we call the grand opening, but that's not going to happen until September, and that's more we invite the community, and it's, it's more of a community outreach. But what's happening May the 15th is really for us as folks who attend this church, believers. It's a dedication of this facility to the proclamation of the gospel. It's asking God's blessing. We've got a fantastic program planned. We're going to have special music, some wonderful testimonies. You'll get a little bit of the history of actually what brought us to this point. So that's the 15th of May. Please make a note of it. Make sure you're here. I think we're going to have a full house, so make sure you're here on time on May the 15th. All right, well, I think that is it for all of our announcements. Again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Very excited about our worship service today. And we're going to begin by singing that great song, We Have This Hope. It's our call to worship. Let's stand. As Jonathan leads us, we have this hope.
Let's bow our heads for prayer together. Father in heaven, we are filled with joy at the thought, at the promise, at the great and blessed hope of Jesus' soon coming. And as we begin this worship hour, we ask for your presence, that Jesus would come now in the person of the Holy Spirit, and that we would receive your presence, your word, your encouragement, your conviction. Whatever we need today, we want to hear from you, Father. Please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. I'd like to share with you this morning just a short thought on one of my favorite Bible characters, Abraham, and what I consider to be the ultimate offering that probably man has ever made. As most of you know, God asked Abraham to give his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. Now, God never intended to actually take his life. He knew Abraham. He had a great relationship, and he used this to test his faith. But Abraham didn't know that God wasn't going to take his life, and he offered him up freely. And um, he didn't do this out of fear or ignorance or blind obedience. He actually did it out of faith and a love for God. And so what can we learn from Abraham's ultimate sacrifice, giving up his son like that? Well, number one, we see that he had an unbelievable trust and faith in God. You see, God had promised that through Isaac, he would have offspring as the sand of the sea and that he would be the father of many nations. And so Abraham believed that no matter what happened, God would make it good. He would make it better than before he had given Isaac. He'd even raise him from the dead if that was necessary. So he had an unbelievable faith and trust in God that he would make things right. Secondly, he believed that God would not only return his offering, but he would multiply it. And in fact, he did. In Genesis 22, 15, we're told that, um, says the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. And as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of thine enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So as a result of this ultimate offering, <clears throat> pardon me, that Abraham offered to God, not only was he blessed, not only was Isaac blessed, not only was all his posterity blessed, but in fact, God pronounced that he would be a blessing to the nations around him as well. Not only now, but for eternity. In fact, you and I may have, uh, have to credit Abraham and Isaac for the fact that we're here today as the father of the faith. And he gives us that opportunity and that invitation to give to him freely as well, that we might invest as Abraham did. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. We just pray that you would inspire us to give as you would have us and that you would use our gifts in a way that would be a blessing to others. Use us to be a blessing to others as you did Abraham, we ask. With our tithes and offerings, we offer them up to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Please stand for scripture. We will be reading out of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. And God's word says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you <clears throat> in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Please remain standing. As we prepare our hearts for worship, please join me in singing 671 as we come to you in prayer. and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound may our lives be transformed by your love may our souls be refreshed from above at this moment let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer for those that are able if you could bow with me and as we kneel in prayer if you're not you simply bow your heads Almighty Father in heaven, Lord, it is a joy and a privilege to gather before you this Sabbath morning in this place that is dedicated to your worship and your service. And Lord, we, as your people, want to come before you first to thank you for your goodness and your many blessings. Thank you for the beautiful spring weather that you've given us. We thank you for the freedom we have to gather together and worship you, and we're we're glad that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel regarding this pandemic, Lord, and, and life returning to some normalcy. We long for that day. Most of all, Lord, we, we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In spite of the beautiful weather, we are living in a very troubled world. And there's so, there's so much pain and sorrow and unrest. And we know that ultimately, uh, all that man can do in this world is just going to be a temporary fix. The only solution will be the coming of your son. And Lord, we want to be ready for that day. We invite him to come into our hearts first to prepare us. And we pray that you'll come into this place right now and speak to our hearts, inspire, teach, be in a special way with our speaker this morning, fill him with the Holy Spirit. We pray ultimately it is your voice that we will hear. And so bless us with your presence. We thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you are just joining us, if you were not here last night, you may not be aware that this morning is part of a series that is going on this entire week called The Seven Deadly Myths, Myths in Christianity. And uh, this is something we hope that you will be bringing your friends to. We have flyers out in the hall. Scott, you came out too soon. I haven't introduced you yet, but you just may as well stay there. We got flyers out in the hall. We hope that you will take a few of these and share them with your friends. And uh, I would like to introduce Scott, our speaker this morning. Scott is the president and speaker for Belt of Truth Ministries, professional school teacher who went into full-time ministry, has a remarkable testimony. I'll let him share more about that with you. He's very popular and sought after at uh, youth conferences and events, has a great, uh, few great series of programs on uh, media and its effect on our culture. And in addition, he has uh, one wife and three children, and they are with him this week. 
And we're just so thankful to have Scott Ritzma and his family with us and uh, ask for God's blessing on him. Would you like to say a hearty amen to welcome him this week to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church? God bless you, Scott. Thank you, Pastor Doug. I am so grateful to be here. Thank you for the music, young people, and all the smiling faces. I am so filled with joy to be in the house of the Lord on the Holy Sabbath day, aren't you? Well, last night we got off to a quick start with a study of myth number one. And those who were here know what myth number one was and how the Bible needs to be the foundation for our lives. And, and not just the Bible, but a true belief and trust in the Word of God. Not a theoretical thing, but something that reaches the heart. Not something where I pick and choose, but a what we call fundamental belief in the Word of God. You remember Pope Francis and a couple of years ago came out and said that to have that fundamental view of, of the Scriptures, he said, was a bad thing. And we said, well, wait a minute. What is the definition of that? And it is taking the Scriptures at face value. The very definition of the Christian faith. We also saw that it was only 19% of Christians who say in the surveys, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, made a personal commitment to Him that is important in my life today. Only 19% of that group believe in some basic, basic questions like God is the all-powerful creator. Satan is real. You can't get to heaven by your own works. There were a number of questions we looked at. And you go, wow, the Christian church is really struggling, hence seven deadly myths in Christianity. You hear popes and, and surveys of Christians saying things that boggle the mind. And we're going, where has the foundation gone? And then we're going to get six more myths in, in 10 meetings, because some of them take a couple of meetings to go through. This message is entitled, Unmasking the Deadly Deceiver. And I want to say something right out of the gates, that this one is foundational, because this will impact everything else we study. So you'll want to come to all the rest. Last night's was good, and it was important. Catch up on that one when you can, but don't miss any more from here till the end, because they build on each other, particularly starting with this one. So if you know some friends, get them online, watching, listening to these very important messages. What we need to know as we approach the last days. Well, actually, maybe the better question and phrase is who we need to know. Because Jesus is the truth that unmasks the deceptions. Jesus is the way and the life that prepares us for his soon coming. So with that in mind, can we have a word of prayer as we begin the message? Bow your heads with me, please. Our loving Father, as we open your word, we want to see Jesus. We want to understand truth. And we want to see this deadly deceiver unmasked for what he is, that we might escape the snares of the enemy, that we might know that we are walking hand in hand safely with our Savior Jesus heavenward. And so we ask for your presence to speak, set aside all of our ideas and the speaker's thoughts, and we just want to hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, myth number two tonight. I encountered this idea a number of years ago, and it quite boggled the mind, you might say, is this even a popular idea? God himself has orchestrated the development of evil, pain, and suffering. He is responsible for it. Believe it or not, this is not only a misconception and a misunderstanding of those who are, you know, more or less ignorant of the word of God, but this is a school of theological thought that is taught, that is believed in out there, that God is somehow the originator, the orchestrator, the divine puppet master of evil. So let's ask some questions this morning. Where did evil come from? Why was it permitted to develop? And why is it still here? And you're going, Scott, how are we going to do that in just one hour? That's going to be impossible because these are questions that have per perplexed the minds of thinking people who've pondered philosophical ideas and big thoughts and things that touch close to the heart about our own pain. How are you going to do that in that amount of time? Well, Lord willing, we'll get a few glimpses out of the Word of God, but I have to give one more mention to those who are viewing online 
put your email address in at deadlymythsbook.com, free book that's going to be released this summer to anybody who puts their email address in. I see some people doing this in-house. I want your attention, students. Don't get on your phones now because there are some yellow notebooks that are actually going to be passed around for the in-house audience. You can write your email address down. You're free to do that, too, on the, on the web form. But everybody whose email address comes in this morning, we're going to send a free book of the whole Seven Deadly Myths series, plus a lot more that we are not getting to, because you noticed last night we were kind of short on time, got cut off, and I had to cut a lot out, amputating, excising large portions of things that we would love to deal with, but time constraints, so we're going to finish it up with the book. So as those, as those notebooks are passed around, you can just pass them back and forth and then send them forward. There will be a notebook in each section, and those who are viewing online, put your email address in at the website. So last night, we raced through some pretty important content, also establishing the credibility and the validity of the Bible. We looked at the historical event of the resurrection. We looked at archaeological, textual understandings for the, the, the really the most well-attested, historically accurate and reliable history of the ancient world is the New Testament writings. And so, again, if you missed that and, and we had to race through it, we're going to expand on that in the forthcoming book, free book. We're going to study this morning, th not a story. I was, I was about to say we're going to study a, a story of how this world came to be the way it is today. But it's not a story. What do you think I'm about to say? It is the story, the one true story. And usually with this story, we begin in Genesis 1, and you like the, the words, you love how that starts when, you, when, it's, when it sounds, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you read through that creation account, and you go, wow, this is beautiful. A perfect earth, perfect people, a perfect God, a perfect place, and the creation was celebrating with singing. Did you know that there were some beings singing about this? Because you, you imagine a world with no deception, with no death, with no depression or debt or divorce or any other horrific D word you can come up with. And you go, that is a beautiful thing, something worth singing about. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, the Lord asks in Job 38. When he laid the foundations of the earth, the morning stars sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay, wait a minute. This is before Genesis chapter 3, where there's a serpent. Before we get there, can we just hang out here for a moment? The perfect creation that God made was something worth singing about, wasn't it? And that's what's coming again in the future, by the way. The new earth, Eden restored. We get to experience that ourselves. It's not just history. It's not just the opening chapter in the story. It is the last chapter in the story, and it's a chapter that continues forever. So what are these stars that we're singing? You know, the Bible uses symbolic language. We understood we want to take a literal, real face value interpretation of the scriptures as we read it. It speaks to us. We don't form it to say what it should say. In our opinion, that was from last night. Stars. Do stars literally sing? The Bible always interprets itself. I want you to turn to Revelation 1. This is super, super helpful to understand who exactly was singing and praising God in this opening act of creation. In Revelation chapter 1, you see in verse 16, he, Jesus, had in his hand, in his right hand, something. Seven what? Seven stars. Now jump over to verse 20, and the Bible will tell us when we read about the stars singing for joy, who these stars represent. It says, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. This is verse 20. The seven stars are the what? The angels. Stars represent what in the Bible? Angels. So the Job verse, when you laid the foundations of the world, the angels were singing for joy at the power and beauty of God. Don't you wish we could just stop there? Because we're like, holy pair in Eden, Adam and Eve, walking with Jesus in the cool of the day, the, 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 the fruits of the tree of life, and a serpent in Eden. Eden. Wait, wait, wait. Where did this serpent come from? 
How did he get there? Why is there a Satan? Well, there's a prequel to Genesis 3 with the serpent. You know where the prequel is? Turn to it in Ezekiel 28. If you're not familiar with the term prequel, this would be the opposite of a sequel. Instead of something that comes after, it is something that goes before. What happened before a serpent ends up in the Garden of Eden? Ezekiel 28 tells us about who this being is that was in Eden. Now, when you start reading this text, you see this is a lamentation for the king of Tyre. But the prophet Ezekiel is not speaking only of the king of Tyre because he starts to pull back the veil and speak of, of the evil spiritual entity that is actuating the king of Tyre, the evil being behind the king of Tyre. In verse 13, you were in Eden. Ezekiel 28, 13. So was the king of Tyre in Eden? Thousands of years before? No, he was not. So this is about the evil being behind the king of Tyre. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. That's musical instruments. If you grew up watching TV, you're well aware that Satan is a musician. Musical instruments, that's a whole other seminar in media on the brain. We won't get into that right now. But the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, this was when he was a beautiful musician in heaven. It was prepared for you on the day that you were, what's the next word? Created. Okay, so he's not an eternal being. He was created at one point. And what kind of being was he? Read in verse 14. You were the anointed what? Cherub who covers a covering cherub. Have you ever seen the imagery of the Ark of the Covenant? You've looked at that recently at Amazing Facts. With the two angels covering and, and being there in the very presence of God. That's what it goes on and says here. I established you in verse 14. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of what? Fiery stones. Our God is a consuming what? Fire, Hebrews 12, verse 29. You've heard of the burning bush and the fiery chariot. Fire in the Bible representing the presence of God. The Shekinah glory of God has the two covering cherubim. This, this angel that we're reading about right here, this cherub was right there next to God. In verse 15, though, it doesn't stay that way. It says, you were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created. So did God make a holy, pure, perfect, to quote the verse, angel? He did. This We're going to see in, in a moment he's named Lucifer. In Isaiah 14, we'll go there in just a second. But he says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was... What's the next word? Very important word. If you're in the habit of underlining in your Bibles... Iniquity was not inserted into Lucifer. Iniquity was found in Lucifer. In fact, jump down to verse 17. It says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. You corrupted your wisdom. His own thoughts. He's inventing a new concept called iniquity that was found in him. It's not God that's responsible for this new idea, this new principle of, well, lifting yourself up. We're going to see that in Isaiah 14. Let's actually turn right there. But you corrupted your own wisdom, he, his own nature. This, this holy angel, this covering cherub, had a perfect nature that God created him with. And then he corrupted his own mind. And iniquity was found in him. You're going to Isaiah 14. Let's look at verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O... What's the word there? Lucifer. That's the name that he was given. That literally means light bearer. Ah, like a star, right? Like a star bears light. So here he is as an angel in heaven, a covering cherub. <clears throat> but it says fallen. How you are fallen. We have a fallen angel here, don't we? Many people have heard of this concept of a fallen angel or they don't quite know where Satan came from. Here it is. It's the story right here that is the prequel to him being a snake in the garden. 
because he was up in heaven as a holy angel, and then now it says you are fallen. How did he fall? Verse 13, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my, what's that next word? Throne above the stars of God. What are the stars again? The angels. He says, I'm going to have a throne and I'm going to rule all the other beings. It says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Whoa, whose throne does he want here? The throne of the most high God. Who do you think you are? He's a created being, and he wants the position of the most high eternal God. You know, if you were to sum up sin, iniquity that was found in him and define it in the most succinct way, iniquity is the self-promotion, self-exaltation, or maybe you boil it down just to selfishness. The root of all sin, the, the definition, the source of all sin, the heart and core of all sin He's saying, I will ascend, I will be above the others, I will rule, I will take the position of God. Philippians 2, by the way, has Jesus doing the opposite. Have you ever noticed that? Where Lucifer said, I will ascend, I will ascend, I will rise above, I will be above the clouds, above the other angels. Jesus, being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be clung on to, but made himself nothing, taking the form of human and a servant and becoming obedient to death, even death of the cross. That's the opposite character. That's when I say I want to be Christ-like, it's not in the sense of Lucifer, I want to be like the Most High and have his throne. I want to have the, his humility, and I want to be Christ-like with that same character that's selflessness. So you see the two principles now at war. I will be like the Most High at the end of verse 14. So what does the Most High receive from his throne? Well, he receives the worship of his throne. His subjects, his created beings. He receives the obedience of his created beings. So that's probably what Lucifer is looking for here. He wants that throne of God. Go to Revelation 12, verses 7, 7 through 9, and we're going to see a little bit more about the nature of this rebellion that he staged in heaven, where he said, I'm going to take the throne of God. Revelation 12 calls it a war. And he's going to actually recruit other angels in his war in this text. Let's read it in Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Now, the Bible uses symbolic language. This, is, this, this dragon, you might wonder, okay, what, is the, what does the dragon represent? We could guess, and we could go, I think it represents China. You know, or No, let's not guess. Let's always go to the word of God as our authority. Verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. Ah, you see, the dragon is the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So, back to verse 7 now. The war broke out in heaven. The dragon fought, and the dragon and his angels fought. Wait a minute. He's got angels on it. Satan's got angels on his side. Where did, where did they come from? Well, read in verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. One third of the stars. What are stars? Angels. One third of the angels are on his side here. His tail, metaphorically speaking, draws them in to his rebellion, to his ideology, to his deceptions. Then, verse 9. Or let's read verse 8 first. But they did not prevail. Praise God nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. By the way, that's why we're doing the seven deadly myths, because deception is the full-time job of the enemy in these last days. He's also the accuser to discourage us. He's the tempter. These are his main gig for this time in Earth's history, where he has, knows his time is short, and he's coming down with great wrath to deceive the whole world. That, we'll come back to that in a future session as well. But he was cast to, I'm at the end of verse, verse 9 now, he was cast to where? To the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So now you've seen the prequel, haven't you? Why is there a serpent in the tree? He was cast to the earth. He had staged this rebellion in heaven, got a third of the angels on his side because he sought that self-promotion of I want the throne of God, 
I want the obedience and worship of the angels of heaven. Now he's on the earth. And you know that story in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that you will... And he plants doubts in Adam and Eve's mind about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So his controversy, his war, his conflict that he began in heaven is taken down here. Can I get humanity on my side like I got a third of the angels? Can I get Adam and Eve? Did he get them? He did. He tempted them into sin. They fall. The fall of humanity happens in Genesis 3. Satan rejoices. But the story doesn't end there, does it? God promises a redeemer. He says, there will come a descendant of Eve who will crush the head of the serpent. Isn't that good news? Now, this story is absolutely critical for us to understand when we are asking these questions about the origin of evil and what God is responsible for in all of these perplexing questions that people ask. A number of years ago, I was confronted with this idea, this notion that God's will, since God is all powerful, his will is deterministic, meaning everything that God wants to happen will happen, and everything that happens happened because God wanted it to happen. God's will determines everything, and everything that happens was God's will. So that becomes a problem for the thinking Christian, because what about human trafficking, child sacrifice? I mean, we could go on and on with all the dark things of this world. Is that God's will? Preposterous notion to even question and ask. The Bible says the angels also had a will, didn't it? It says you corrupted your wisdom. Lucifer made a choice, didn't he? He corrupted his own wisdom and iniquity was found in him. Found in him. Not God putting it there deterministically. How about human beings? Do we have a will? Well, gladly, we don't have to speculate, we don't have to wonder, we don't have to theorize, we don't have to form opinions. The Bible says it straight out in Luke 7, verse 30. It says the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. And the context of that was having not been baptized by John the Baptist. So did you hear the underlined part there? It is possible for a human being to reject God's will for them. That's absolutely critical as a foundation for understanding God's character. Because God is sovereign. He has all the power that he could ever have at his disposal. He speaks worlds into existence. He is sovereignty. He, is sovereign. he makes the calls, right? He's the king. And in his sovereignty, he has declared that we shall have a will. And that we can choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Have you read that verse in Joshua 24, 15? He asks us to choose him. Lucifer rejected him. The Pharisees also rejected the will of God for them. God's will is not deterministic in the sense that he has declared evil and pain and suffering. It's the will of sinful mortals like the Pharisees. It's the will of angels who joined in the deception. And I'm sure you've noticed evil people do a lot of evil things with their perverted, perverted wills. Have you noticed that? Maybe you have a past. I do. And I go, what was I thinking? We've noticed we look around at horrific things that people do with their free will that God has given to them. They make choices that grieve the heart of God. If somebody hurt you or hurt a loved one, that was not God's doing, his will, anything that pleases God. Satan was delighting in that. He was tempting that. He was encouraging that. God's heart was breaking with the person suffering, the person in pain, the person a victim of something. God, his love for us is infinite. It is infinitely empathetic. And you think about the, the feeling a parent has when their child is hurt. We're God's children, and he has way more love for us than we have for our children. How much pain does he feel? Now, if you think about it, if God's will was always done, then wouldn't everybody be saved? Because the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. So how many people does God want to perish? None. He wants all to come to repentance. If God's will was always declared to be done in a deterministic sense, then everybody would be saved. Because <laughs> he, that's what he wants, of course. 
He wants everybody to repent and be saved. It says it also in 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He want, he's not, his will is that nobody perish. And we can form opinions. We people do that. Like we become theologians and we listen to theologians and we form opinions about what God's sovereignty means. And we'll just let the word of God say what it means. It means he desires and wills and his will is that everybody be saved. And as you notice, not, not everybody will be as you've read the scriptures about the second death and about the punishment of the wicked and about the broad road to destruction. Many scriptures indicate that we will not have everybody choosing God and his salvation, his free gift of salvation. It's offered to every soul. You can have it right now for the taking. Jesus' sacrifice was for every person. You might say, but I'm one of those who's had a perverted will and has victimized others. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think I read that somewhere. And that he is kind to the wicked, it says in Luke. Jesus, the Father, gives, gifts, gives his Son to those who are enemies of him. That's you. Now, you might say, well, why doesn't God just then coerce the will, force the conscience, make everybody choose him so that there isn't anybody who's lost and victimized and captive to Satan? Well, we're going to get to that shortly, but sometimes it's better to just go, you know what, I don't need the why. I don't need for God to explain himself to me. I trust, he's shown himself enough. It's kind of like parents. Sometimes the kid comes like, why such and such? Sometimes parents explain it, and sometimes they go, because dad said so, because mom said so, right? You know our wisdom and our love, and you trust Right? So we could just end it there, but I want to explore this further because there's, certain, there's, there's one text that people will raise and be like, God created evil. It says it right there in Isaiah 45, 17. God creates evil. Now, if the Hebrew of Isaiah 45, 7, 7 says literally that God is the author of evil, the inventor of evil and iniquity, then we've got a Bible that contradicts itself because it says iniquity was found in Lucifer. It said he corrupted his wisdom. In Matthew 13, Jesus says with regard to, to evil in the world, an enemy has done this. God takes no responsibility for it. So what does that mean in your King James? This is the Old English, which is translated from Hebrew and means something in our modern language that the other Bible English translations get absolutely correct. It is calamity, disaster for a nation who is rebelling against God. God brings punishment upon particularly his nation, Israel. He sent the northern kingdoms to Assyria. He sent the, the Ju Judah to Babylon. And so God will bring calamity, disaster. And why, why would he do such a thing, you might say? Well, it's kind of like a parent who sometimes, like, your kid gets out of line and is rebellious toward mom and dad. Like, we're going to need to bring some calamity to wake you up here. It's out of love. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Revelation 3, verse 19. God loves those he disciplines. And Hebrews 12, 11 says the reason he does this is not for evil. It's for the opposite. It says, now chastening now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Like, you don't enjoy the punishment, but it's painful when you're being punished. When you're being disciplined is maybe a better word for it. But it says, nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of what? Of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God brings calamity upon Israel to bring the fruit of righteousness. It's, it's the opposite of evil, isn't it? So God doesn't create evil. The Bible says he is the, in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Now, you might be wondering, does that mean like every disaster that comes in the world or every terrible thing that happens in our lives is like God bringing it and bringing discipline? Not everything, because there was a time where a man was born blind. Do you remember the story in John chapter 9? And the Pharisees said to Jesus, all right, who's, who's sinned? Who's getting punished here, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And do you remember what Jesus said? He said, neither, neither. Because we just live in a fallen world, don't we? There are consequences of Adam and Eve's choice that afflict and affect everybody. And it's not God doing it. And it's just the devil's made a mess of this planet. So back to what happened in Eden and how he made a mess of this planet. Remember Satan first sought that position of God in heaven 
which the, the throne of God, the prerogatives and privileges of that are the worship and obedience of the subjects of heaven. He wants that on this earth now. He says, can I get the obedience of Adam and Eve? Can I get them on my side? He even sought the worship of Jesus. Let's fast forward to Matthew 4. All these I will give you, he said. All the world and all the kingdoms of this world I will give you, he said to Jesus, if you will fall down and, what's the next word there? Worship me. Satan is absolutely obsessed with receiving worship. He's still on that quest he was on in heaven, even though he got cast out and his war failed up there. He still thinks he can get the worship even of the Son of God. His entire mission of deception seems to center around this quest to receive worship. In fact, all of the heathen religions, every false religion out there, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I say that the things which the Gentiles, or the heathen, the pagans, sacrifice, they sacrifice to who? To what? To demons and not to God. This is why the first two commandments in the Ten Commandments are about worshiping God, having no other gods before him, do not have idols in our lives. It's because Satan wants to worship unto himself, and if he can get our attention off of anything other than God, he's succeeded in his quest, hasn't he? Because every Gentile or pagan religion, when they're offering their sacrifices, they're doing their worship ceremonies, Paul says they are worshiping demons because God is being withheld. His worship is being withheld from the rightful God. In the last days, go to Revelation 13 with me. In the last days, there's a, an entity upon the earth that's referred to as the beast power or the Antichrist, which we will study in a subsequent session. But I want you to see what the agenda of Satan is through this emissary of his, the Antichrist. You're going to notice a word repeated three times. And if you were here last night, threes are special in the Bible. They represent an emphasis. When you see holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, I won't repeat them all, but many times in the Bible you will see a threefold emphasis. When something repeated three times, it gets our attention, including Mark chapter 13, be not deceived in the last days. Take heed that no one deceive you. People will do signs of wonders and deceive the very elect if that were possible. So deception is a serious thing, as we started with last night. Now, what is the devil's goal here in verse 4? So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And then in verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There's that lamb again. This is really about Jesus being the true, the true God of the, that we worship. Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This says Satan is trying to supplant the position of Jesus. He wants to worship, doesn't he? The dragon, the beast, the beast power, the antichrist power. If Satan can get worship unto that, then he's gotten his goal. So go to 2 Thessalonians 2, and while you're turning there, I, I, want, I want to show you something here on the screen. You've seen a number of news articles like this where overt Satan worship is gaining ground in our society. This kind of thing is absolutely dark and disgusting. It's, it's terrible that there are children that they put on that and that image, looking up to Baphomet there. But I want to mention that as, as horrific as that is, and we should call it out and call people to Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and say every person, even somebody who's been a Satan worshiper, can come to the cross, and he, your name can be written in the book of life from the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But that kind of thing is only going to appeal to a relatively small sector of society. What you're going to see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is how Satan casts his net of deception very wide here. It says, let no one deceive you by any means. I'm in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin... This is a reference to the beast power, the antichrist power, the, lo the lawless one, the little horn, is revealed. The son of perdition, remember that, we'll come back to that in a second, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So you see the conflict is over worship. So that he, this, this antichrist power, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
He wanted that position in heaven, didn't he? Satan did. He's going to have his agent be in the very temple of God. What is the temple of God in the New Testament? We'll study this in a future lesson. It is the, the Christian church. He's going to claim to be God in the midst of God's people as a son of perdition. Now, John chapter 17, verse 12, uses that phrase, son of perdition. And do you know who it's in reference to? Judas Iscariot. So, what was Judas Iscariot like? He was in the midst of the twelve. He was a fraudulent disciple, wasn't he? That's what this Antichrist deception is going to be like. So when we hear Satan is seeking the worship of all the inhabitants of the world, it's not just through pagan, heathen sacrifices. It's not just through Baphomet. It's through this thing that looks Christian like a son of perdition in the very temple of God, which is the Christian church. Verse 7. This is his agenda here in a nutshell. For the mystery of lawlessness, that's one, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the second time I've seen the word lawless there whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. I hope during this series we are receiving not just the truth, but the love of the truth. You see the difference? It's not a mere intellectual assent to acknowledge the actuality of the scripture, the truth in the, of the matter. It is a truth that transforms. And we love the truth and we won't be deceived because we love the truth and we cling to it. And Jesus is the truth. And our relationship with Jesus is number one in our lives. But the devil is seeking to take down God's law. Did you see it repeated three times, particularly in your New King James, captures this very well. The lawless one, the lawless one, the lawless one. So Satan seems to not like God's law. Are you catching that? Well, of course he's lawless because he wanted his own law. He wanted the position in heaven, didn't he? So you see in Daniel 7 the same thing. We're going to study that. This Antichrist power thinks it can change the very law of God. So there was war in heaven. The war continues all the way down to the last days, as you see in these prophecies in Revelation 13 and in 2 Thessalonians 2. The war is Satan's lawlessness versus God's law. God's rightful authority to receive our worship and obedience Satan's fraudulent claims to overturn God's law and receive the same from people. So if so, if this is the real conflict, then what will be the heart of God's people? It will be our, our desire is to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we're not going to let the devil get anything, any foothold in our lives. In fact, Paul says, know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Now, why did I underline that part of the word that says serve there? Well, Paul just said, the one that you obey, you are actually serving. Now, what does serve mean in the Bible? Have you read in the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, thou shalt not bow down to thyself, Thou down thyself to them, nor what? Serve them. What does that mean? That means worship, doesn't it? Let my people go, Moses said, that we may go out and serve the Lord in the desert. What are we in right now? A worship service, right? So to serve the Lord in the commandment, in the second commandment, is to worship him. And Paul just said in Romans 6, 16, that whom we obey, we are serving so obedience is really the highest form of worship, isn't it? That's a beautiful thing. Are we obedient to God? Because the devil is seeking to overturn that. If Satan can get people obeying him or his antichrist rather than God, then he has actually succeeded in receiving worship. Remember this concept for a future session that we're going to touch on because this is foundational. If Satan can get people obeying him or his antichrist rather than obeying God, then he has succeeded in receiving the worship 
of people who do thus. Well, then what will the last days people be like? The dragon was enraged with a woman, this is the church of God, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the what? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Blessed are those who do his what? Command was that just three times again? The book of Revelation three times says that God's last day people will be eschewing Satan's deceptions, avoiding his worship, worship, worship that he seeks, and will be the commandments, the commandments, the commandments at the heart of God's people's desire to obey him. Now, did you notice the part about the faith of Jesus? That goes back to last night where the majority of Christians surveyed thought that they could get to heaven by their own works. No, Jesus' merits alone and his righteousness alone are what, what grant us salvation and an entrance into the city of God. Never forget that when we talk about commandments. And we'll deal with that issue of, the, of God's law and grace and salvation in, in a future session. But here we are looking at this grand story, this great controversy. And it brings up this problem of evil question. If God knows the future, if God is all loving and God is all powerful, then people have posited the question, why then not just destroy Satan at the beginning? He started his rebellion. We understand he had a will. He had that, that, that idea he invented in his own mind of iniquity, of self-promotion. Well, right after that, why didn't God just end the rebellion? Have you ever wondered that? Well, we could just go, I just trust God. I don't need, I don't need an answer to that. The wonderful thing about God's word is it gives us so much to go on that we don't have to have any doubts, any, any lingering, I don't know if I can trust Jesus with my life. I don't know if the word of God is, is worthy of my confidence. Never, because there's so much there for us to go on. So let's ask this question. After Satan rebelled, did God have enough power to cast him to the earth like a pebble? I mean, he, he speaks worlds into existence. He could have gone poof and the devil's gone. Has God proven his love to us in Christ at Calvary? There's no doubting his power or his love. So there's no if in the equation. If God is all powerful and all loving, then what? There's, he's already proven it. There's no if about it. But just to entertain the idea for a moment, imagine this. The Lucifer, Lucifer this, 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 he's Satan now, the adversary, he's got a third of the angels listening to his lies, his whisperings, his rebellions, and he's recruiting them, as we saw in Revelation 12, verse 4. And what is he saying to them? What you can imagine, well, we know from John 8, verse 44, that when he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. Have you ever read that? So, like, if his, you, you know he's lying if his mouth is moving, right? He's lying to the angels. And who's, whose throne does he want again? The throne of God. So he's lying, therefore, of course, about God himself. And these insinuations, these doubts that sound a little like the thing he said to Eve, did God really say, you know, you can't trust him. He's holding out on you. He's pulling back what real pleasure you could find if you eat of this fruit and you can be like God. He's being selfish, a tyrant to hold on to his position. You can have Godhood too. You can imagine the same thing said in heaven as he said to Eve. So the rebellion has sprouted. The angels are hearing the rumors, or at the very least they have questions. And they're wondering, is Lucifer... They've never heard anything like this before. They've lived in eternal bliss from the moment they were created. And wait, Lucifer's always been good. And he's right next to God, and God is good. They're wondering. They have questions. Now imagine that another message comes in, an announcement from heaven to all the angels... Lucifer was just destroyed. Let's use an analogy to think how that would land in the minds of these intelligent people, angels with a will and a heart and mind and conscience. Okay, and the analogy goes like this. A White House aide comes out to the media and he says, I have some disturbing news for you. That you're, and he's fabricating a lie about the president of the United States. And he says, the president is not who you think he is. And I'm going to hold a press conference tomorrow and spill all the beans to tell you the real truth about him. And I'll give you some little hints and juicy things. And then, okay, then the next morning, right before the press conference is to start, this White House aide 
is found dead on the banks of the Potomac. Uh, this isn't looking very good for the president, is it? It's looking kind of suspicious. So God knows doubts have been insinuated into the minds of these angels. A war has begun and accusations have been made against God. So amazingly, the God of heaven, the sovereign, the all-powerful, almighty God is in a position of being assessed, being judged. As it says in Romans 3 verse 4, let, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words, that you may overcome when you, capital Y, when God is judged. God is being judged and assessed for is his character the way that, it, that, we, that we know it is. Well, I'm hearing all these lies and deceptions. God says, I'm going to vindicate my, my character. In Revelation 16, verse 7, and in Revelation 19, verse 2, the announcement is made, righteous and true are your judgments. God's character is vindicated in the end. And every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord in the end. But in the meantime, as amazing as it sounds, as incredible as it sounds, the God of heaven is in a position of waging a disputation with Satan. His character has been assassinated, and he is going to vindicate his his name, his law, his authority, his position. And, of course, Jesus proved it all at the cross. Now, why not just crush the rebellion and just say, serve me or else? He has the power. He has every right to do that. Why not just crush it immediately and say, serve me or else? Well, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. God is a God of freedom. Why is God a God of freedom? Have you ever read in 1 John 4 verse 8 that God is love? And you can't have love without freedom, can you? There's no such thing as forced love. Have you ever thought about that? You can force compliance. You can force outward obedience. But you can't force Love. Let me use romantic love as an analogy here. A number of years ago, in November of 2002, I took a liking to this young lady that I had been courting for some time. Her name was Cammie. And I said, I want to marry her. She's here in the audience with my family right now. And so I had this idea. I'm going to have Song of Solomon open. I'm going to get down on one knee and I'm going to ask her to marry me. And I did it. And now, I, I, I didn't have this thought. Now, what if she says no? I'd better have a backup plan. <laughs> so I decided to conceal Carrie. And I said, will you marry me? And she, this is not what happened, of course. So oh, I don't know, honey. Uh, I don't know if we're ready. I don't, I don't think I can. Well, you will marry me or else. <laughs> right? I didn't do that because any love that was in the room at that point would have been extinguished in a heartbeat because you can't force love, can you? And I didn't want a Stepford wife either, if you remember the old 70s concept of the robotic wives. You can't love if you're robotically programmed. That's how evil arose, because Lucifer wasn't robotically programmed to do what God wanted him to do. God says iniquity was found in you. He corrupted his own wisdom. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The greatest commandment in the law, Jesus said. God wants our loyalty. He wants our worship. He wants our obedience as an expression of our love to him. He wants us to love him. That's the number one thing. And there are certain things, my friends, that God cannot do. You might be like, how can you say that? There are certain things God cannot do. It says in Hebrews 6 verse 18, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. It says it also in Titus 1 verse 2. There are certain things God cannot do. He cannot lie and he cannot force love, can he? So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's God's sovereignty that declared that, not, my, not our own ideas or our own theories. But if he rules by coercive force in heaven, not only does it betray his character of love and freedom, but then the angels are serving him out of fear, like, is he going to squash me? And what, what does that produce? Is fear, are fear and love compatible? No, perfect love drives out all fear, John says. Now, the Bible also says, fear God and give glory to him. What kind of fear is that? Respect, awe, admiration. 
to, to give him the glory that he deserves as the almighty God. But he also wants us to love him, not to be terrified of him. So Nahum 1 verse 9 says, affliction is not going to arise a second time. How does God make sure that he ends this rebellion, ends evil and pain and suffering in a way that guarantees that it won't arise again? Have you ever wondered that? Turn to Matthew 13. I've, I've wondered that because we know God's going to destroy evil and pain and suffering and Satan's going to be destroyed. We know that from Bible prophecy. Well, how is Satan, how is God going to make sure that nobody ever comes Lucifer 2.0 in the future? All right, I'm going to come up with an idea too. He's going to make sure it doesn't happen and we're going to see how and why. Now, by the way, this myth that we are studying tonight, that God is somehow responsible for and orchestrating evil and pain and suffering, this is a deadly, deadly myth for one central reason. And that is we are saved by God's grace through faith. What does faith mean? It means trusting him. And if Satan can get into our heads a distorted picture of God's character, a view of him that is not accurate, a view of him that is dark and distant, a view of him that is uncaring, that delights in pain and suffering, is that a God that is easier or harder to come to in trust and faith? It's harder. Satan wants to make that gap between us and God. God says, I'm going to come near to you. So the reason we're dealing with this big philosophical concept is not just for prophecy and the future things we're going to study, understanding obedience and worship in God's law, but it's really about our relationship with God. Seeing him and his love and coming to him in trust. Now, Matthew 13. This is an amazing parable. I love this parable. And we're going to do it backwards, okay? Because Jesus tells the parable and then the disciples are left going, oh, we don't understand it. Explain the parable to us. We're going to start with his explanation where it tells you all what these different uh, parts are of the parable. And then we're going to go back and read the parable. So we're going to start in verses 36 to 39. And you're going to collect a few different identifiers here that are going to appear in a parable. You're going to hear about field, a field and wheat and tares and a bunch of things. Let's read it. It says in verse 37, He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. So, okay, you got that one? The good seed represents the son of the man. The one who is sowing the good seed represents Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares or weeds are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. You're going, Scott, I'm not going to memorize all these. We'll review them as we go back through. And then the reapers are the angels. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. The enemy is Satan. The field is the world. The one sowing the good seed is the son of man. The, the, the good seed is good and the evil seed is evil. Now let's read the parable in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. So the Son of Man, Jesus, sowed good in the world. But while men slept, his enemy came, Satan came, and sowed tares, or evil, among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So you have a world with good and evil in it. Jesus sowed the good, Satan sowed the evil. We've already covered that. We're clear on that part, right? We're asking the question now, why is it lasting so long? Why, is, why are we still here? And how is God going to make sure this sin doesn't rise again a second time? So let's, let's see what these workers say, the servants say in verse 27. They came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Isn't that the question people are asking? God, you're all powerful and all loving and you're the author only of good. Why is there evil then? And his answer is, an enemy has done this. And that's what we've covered already. The servant said to him, a reasonable question. Do you want us to go and gather them up? Can we, can we be done? Can we be done with our limited mortal minds? We're just going, let's just end it. Let's just you know, wrap it up thousands of years ago right away. Well, he says no in verse 29. Don't go and gather up the tares. That, that perplexes people. That why? Why? Why, God? Why All-powerful, all-loving God. They're asking the same question here, and he explains it to them. He says, no, 
lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, the end of the age, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then go to verse 40, and you read about, then he throws them in the fire, it's the end of the age, and lawlessness will be weeded out of his kingdom, and the righteous will shine forth like the sun forever and ever. So did you hear he said, don't pull the weeds yet. They're still small. We've got weeds and wheat, and if you pull the weeds out when they're small, when they haven't grown yet to the harvest, then you're going to pull up the wheat with them. In other words, you, with your untrained minds, can't necessarily discern clearly early on in this process what is the very root of evil and good. You're going to make some confusion there. If we end this thing too soon, people are going to go, what? I, I, I don't know. I don't understand. Wait, I thought that was weeds. Wait, I thought that was wheat. By the way, scholars tell us that there are weeds in the ancient Near East in this context that did look like wheat. So that's kind of interesting, the connection there from the, the historical context. So it makes sense to us, though, doesn't it? Sometimes when you're growing a garden, you see little things, you're like, is that wheat or is that wheat? Or is that my crop that's just sprouting? But when they're bigger, so he says, wait, 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 because there is, a, there is an ingredient from the equation that is left out. When people say God is all-powerful and all-loving, and if he was, he would destroy the evil now, and therefore I'm going to be an atheist. Well, hold on, you left an ingredient out. God is also all wise. And he is going to make sure, because he is all powerful and will destroy evil, and because he is all loving and doesn't want it to arise again and cause more pain and suffering, he knows the future and when the time is ripe, I was going to say when the time is right, but do you see the analogy? When the wheat is ripe and the weeds have displayed their horrific, ghastly uh, evil, the, 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 the horrific nature of evil is being manifest so that in eternity future, nobody looks back and goes, yeah, I don't know if God was right in that. No, just and true are your ways and your judgments. And then the universe is secure forever because God didn't do it too soon. Now, by the way, we ask God the problem of evil. How could an all God? You know what? The Bible says that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the world and then the end shall come. And in 2 Peter 3, verse 12, it says we can hasten the second coming by living holy lives. So wait a minute. You're telling me that God should be asking us that question, shouldn't he? If we were preaching the gospel and growing up as the wheat into the holiness and the stature and the measure of the fullness of Christ, then we would be hastening the end. So why are we still here? It's not God's fault. And I'm not trying to blame. We all need to look in the mirror. God could very well ask us that question, couldn't he? Now I want to give you the ultimate answer to the problem of evil. It's right there, pictured on the screen. You might have all the philosophical, theological, biblical texts and, that we've studied, but when it comes down to it and somebody looks you in the eye like somebody did to me once and said, Scott, you're a Christian. Why did my daughter just die in a car accident last night? Why did God do this to her? I wasn't about to get this whole study out and go through all the intellectual stuff. And I said, you know, Jesus, she was a Christian. She was faltering in her faith. And I said, you know what it says in Isaiah 63, verse 9? It says that in our affliction, God is afflicted. And that's all you need to say during those moments. I would love it if everybody was fortified with this study before hard times. But if we have only 30 seconds to say something as we close today, it is Jesus is with you in your pain and he endured it. More pain than all human suffering combined. Jesus took it at the cross. Do you trust him? You know his word is credible. We've seen that last night. He's died for our sins. Give your heart fully to him as we close in prayer. Lord Jesus, here's our heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your commitment to us that you came to this world to prove your love and that we can trust you now with our lives. We pray that you'd give us a deeper walk with you as we see your character, that we might trust you and know that you are our Savior. We want to know you, for that is eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're saying goodbye to the online audience at that point, and I believe we're going to have a closing song. Six one four, sound the battle cry. upon his holy word rouse then soldiers rally round the banner ready steady pass the word along onward forward shout aloud hosanna christ is captain of the mighty throng strong to meet the foe marching on we go we know must prevail shield the banner bright gleaming in the light battling for the right we ne'er can fail rouse then soldiers rally round the banner ready steady pass the word along onward forward shout aloud hosanna christ is captain of the mighty throng O thou God of all hear us when we call help us one and all by thy grace when the battle's done and the victory won may we wear the crown before thy face rouse then soldiers rally round the banner Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Amen. Please be seated. Were you blessed this morning? Amen. I really enjoyed that presentation. Now, I want to remind you, um, tonight, 7 o'clock, is part two of what we started this morning. So you don't want to miss it. 7 o'clock, right back here at the church. Uh, we're going to be having some music, uh, a song service, just prior to going on the air at 7 o'clock. So if you want to be at 6.45, we encourage you to do that. You can sing, and then we will start right at 7. I also want to remind you that we have a baptismal class starting at 1.30 this afternoon. It's going to be in the church chapel, which is right over there. You go down the hallway, just follow the hallway until you get to the church chapel. I'm going to have one final prayer, and then following the prayer, our postlude is going to be brought to us by the orchestra. And we want to thank all of the young people and those who might not be so young, but those who are young in heart for being part of our orchestra. It's just added so much wonderful uh, music. Thank you to our orchestra leader, and I believe there's some Weimar students involved as well, so we want to thank them all for being here. Let's just have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, what a joy it has been to gather in your presence today on this special Sabbath, and as we go our separate ways, we want to invite you to go with us, Lord, and uh, bring us back. Be with those doing the outreach at 3 o'clock this afternoon, and then be with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.